Hello and welcome. I'm Angèle Benaur, National Director, Family Services with the Huntington Society of Canada. It is my honor to introduce this next session entitled Considering Choices at End of Life, Including Medical Assistance and Dying Are Made. This session is offered by June Churchill and Carrie Hale, both of whom are volunteers with the Calgary chapter of Dying with Dignity Canada. The presentation discusses the range of end of life options that may be considered by someone with a life limiting disease. One of the options discussed is MAID. The MAID portion of the presentation focuses on changes to the legislation since the passage of Bill C-7 in March of 2021. It explains the two track system that was introduced by Bill C-7 with particular emphasis on the definition of, reasonable, of reasonably foreseeable death. The presentation also describes MAID in practice, including how to apply, the assessment process, and the actual delivery of MAID. There will be a Q&A at the end, so please be sure to submit your questions in the question tab throughout the presentation. You'll find that on the right. You will also find a copy of the presentation in the files tab, also on the right. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. June Churchill is a retired clinical social worker. In retirement, she focuses her energy and interest in the areas of conscious aging and conscious dying. June joined the Dying with Dignity Calgary chapter in 2012 and has been on their executive for the past six years. She's presented many workshops about end of life choices and assisted dying, both before and after Bill C-14 to legalize medical assisted death in 2016. June actively supports and educates about increased access to palliative care and the variety of planning options and choices at end of life. She also supports the right to, ch the right to choose at end of life for those who wish to explore a medically assisted death. Carrie Hale has a master's degree in economics from UBC and spent her professional career as a management consultant retiring in 2013. She became involved in the Calgary chapter of Dying with Dignity Canada shortly after its inception in 2012. She watched her father disappear gradually over a 10 year period due to Alzheimer's and is passionately committed to improving access to MAID for those people like her father who wanted MAID but were denied it. Carrie has also volunteered for UNICEF Canada for the past 24 years. Thank you so much, Carrie and June, for participating in our conference. The floor is yours. Thank you, Angel, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, too, to everybody out there. Um, as Angel said, uh, my name is Carrie Hale. I am the current co-chair of uh, the Calgary chapter of Dying with Dignity Canada. June is the past co-chair. Calgary is one of 12 chapters across Canada, all completely volunteer run. Um, next uh, slide, please, Angel. Uh, Dying with Dignity Canada is a national human rights charity based in Toronto. It's been around for about 40 years. Uh, in the early days, we were focused primarily on getting medical assistance in dying made uh, legalized. Um, made is still a priority for us in the sense that we would like to see access to it broadened. But we're also very concerned that there be a selection of end of life choices available to Canadians that they know what those choices are and that they document them. Um, I will now turn it over to June to uh, discuss alternatives other than made. Okay, next slide. When discussing end-of-life choices, it's important to include MAID as one of the end-of-life considerations when a life-threatening diagnosis is made. Due to the shortness of time, I won't cover all the issues on this slide. I'd like to start with number three, withdrawing treatment. In the latter days of illness, or uh, patients can request to have further, informations, uh, further interventions stopped, and they can also have life-sustaining uh, life supports removed at that time. And that could be intravenous feeding, dialysis, pacemakers, or other life-extending uh, interventions. 
It's true that all our medical developments have helped extend life, but they've also started to extend our dying. And so patients should be aware that they can discontinue uh, processes if they want to. Next is palliative sedation. This is when a doctor and a patient discuss that increasing their pain medication uh, could also mean that they go into a coma or die sooner. And it's not a patient's right to ask for palliative sedation, but it's certainly something they can discuss with the doctor. The doctor has to write an order saying that they're increasing the medication, which is usually morphine, uh, to a high dose to control pain, but also aware that it may hasten die. Voluntary eating and drinking is known as VSED, v -Z -E -D, v -S -E -D. Patients who are extremely ill uh, do lose their interest in eating and drinking. It's a natural process of the body shutting down. VSED can be discussed with the patient and the family and the doctors and is best undertaken with medical supervision, often with the person in uh, hospice or palliative care. No food or drink is given and death usually occurs between 15 and 30 days, but within that time, the patient has lost interest in eating and drinking and often is in a coma. Families need to be supported if the patient chooses voluntary stopping eating and drinking because they feel the urge to show their love and compassion for the patient by giving food. And so this is really uh, needs to be a, a family counseling decision that gets made as well. One of my background interests was in suicide, suicide attempts and suicide interventions. And I'm really concerned about um, people who come to the end of their life and attempt suicide when and not know that me medical assistance in dying is available. So suicide is sometimes contemplated by patients when they deal with increasing pain or disability or with a terminal illness. They want to give up. They don't want to go any, on any further. And sometimes they feel they need to be motivated to do this by themselves in private. Medical personnel should distinguish between suicidal ideation and a patient's desire to hasten their inevitable death or when patients are asking questions about medical assistance in dying. In an article in the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers uh, brochure, they said that one research study found that 94% of cancer patients and 50% of ALS patients wanted to discuss all the options at end of life and that MAID should be part of that discussion as they're looking at how their illness will progress. Several research papers I consulted said that suicide and suicidal ideation are significantly higher in patients with neuro neurodegenerative diseases, including those that have Huntington's. There's a clinical difference between people who have suicidal ideation or attempts who do not have life-limiting physical illnesses and those who have serious incurable illness, disease, or disability who may be seeking to hasten their death. Dying with dignity discourages the use of the term assisted suicide, which is often used for medical assistance in dying. We prefer that people begin to use the terms physician-assisted death or medical assistance in dying. Suicide attempts are carried out alone, in secret, usually involving a, vol a violent act, and the family is left confused and in distress because they weren't aware that this has happened and they want to know how they could have stopped the suicide. With a hastened death with MAID, the person has been assessed by two medical staff. They know that they are going to die. The family has been part of the process. And with MAID, the patient feels in control of their life. They know they have choices and that they can change their mind. The end is peaceful and without distress. Palliative care and hospice care. Access to palliative care and hospice care needs to be expanded in Canada and available in smaller communities. This comfort care at end of life is usually able to control pain and assist the patient and the family to accept that death is close. The Dying with Dignity organization, many physicians and over 80% of Canadians in several surveys agreed that patients with life-limiting illnesses should be informed of all their end-of-life options, and that includes MAID. Back to you, Carrie.
Thank you, June. Um, next slide, I think you're, Angel, go back one slide, please. There we are, thank you. Um, this slide shows how May developed in Canada. It, actual events, were, of course, were a lot more complicated than this, but this does provide some context. Uh, I'm sure many of you recognize the name Sue Rodriguez. Uh, she was a BC woman who had ALS and who in 1993 asked the Supreme Court of Canada for um, medical aid in, in dying. Um, they voted against her five to four. 20 years later, uh, the Supreme Court was considering two very similar requests. The plaintiffs in this case were two BC women again, um, Kay Carter, 89, and Gloria Taylor, 64. Um, this time, all nine judges uh, agreed unanimously to decriminalize medically assisted death for competent adults with a grievous and irremediable condition and who clearly consented to the termination of life. I have read that because it, it's an important distinction from the bill that eventually came forth. Um, that decision is known as the Carter decision. Uh, the result was Bill C-14, was passed in June of 2016. It was more restrictive in the Car than the Carter decision in that it limited the availability to made to those whose deaths were reasonably foreseeable although the term wasn't legally defined. It didn't take long for that to be challenged. Uh, it was brought forward by two Montrealers who presented their case in Quebec Superior Court, Jean Trouchon, and Nicole, 51, and Nicole Gladue, 74, were suffering intolerably from incurable degenerative illnesses, but were ineligible for MAID because their deaths were not reasonably foreseeable. The judge ruled that that restriction was unconstitutional. So in March of 2021, Bill C-7 was passed. It removed the necessity that death be reasonably foreseeable, but as we'll see, there are some strings attached. Changes are already in the works. Bill C-7 requires a mandate of several topics. Um, and a report is due by 2023. We don't get into these topics because we, we simply don't have time. Uh, next slide, please, Angel. So in Canada, from the time MAID was legalized in 2016 to 2020, that is the last year for which data are, are available. There have been about 21,600 MAID deaths across Canada. 70% of these have been terminal cancer patients and 10% have been neurological conditions. The average age was 75. That number of deaths comprises 2.5% of the total deaths in Canada over the same time period. Rates have increased every year, which is understandable as people become more familiar with MAID, um, but it is unlikely that rates will skyrocket as some people have, have suggested. Se firstly, we have significant safeguards. Secondly, we have some data from several countries in Europe uh, that are reassuring. Switzerland has allowed assisted suicide since 1942, that's 80 years. In 2015, and I'm not sure why the data, why we don't have more recent data than that, um, but in 2015, uh, made type deaths as a percentage of all deaths was 1.4%. This, this may well have increased since 2015. In Belgium, which has allowed made since 2009, the rate in 2018 was 2.1%. Uh, the Netherlands have also had a, a made type program since 2009 and in 2020, uh, the rate of made deaths was 4.1%. Uh, next slide, please, Anja. Thank you. So who is currently eligible for made? Um, the patient must be over the age of 18, mu must have mental competency and be eligible for publicly funded health not available for non-residents. The person has to have made the request voluntarily. Um, it cannot have been due to coercion. Uh, the person must have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability. They must be in advanced state of irreversible decline in capability, and they must have enduring and intolerable physical or psychological suffering that cannot be alleviated under conditions the person considers acceptable. 
Next slide, please. So Bill C-7 is where we're at right now. And as Angel mentioned, the, the main thing that Bill C-7 did was it divided applications for MAID into two tracks. Track one is where death is reasonably foreseeable. Track two is where it isn't. Which track the person will be assessed in will be up to the people doing the assessment. This slide describes the, the differences between these two tracks. In the case of assessors, both tracks must have two assessors. They can be physicians or nurse practitioners, uh, and they determine whether the person applying is eligible for MAID and which track they fit into. For, un, for Bill, sorry, excuse me, under track two, for people where death is not reasonably foreseeable, one of those assessors must have expertise in the person's condition, or they must consult someone who does have that expertise. This is so that the assessors fully understand the expected progression of the life limiting illness. In terms of waiting period, there's no waiting period in track one between the provision between the second assessment and the provision of made there. There can be a waiting period, but there doesn't have to be. In the case of track two, the waiting period is 90 days, although this can be shortened if there is a risk that the patient will lose capacity. Counseling. Um, under track two, um, where death is not reasonably foreseeable, the patient must be informed of available measures to relieve their suffering. This could include mental health and disability support services, community services, and palliative care. The patient does not have to accept any of these services, but they have to have considered them seriously. This was expected practice under Bill C-14, but is now a legal requirement. Possibly the most important difference under Bill C-7 is final consent. This is very important for anyone whose medical condition includes the likelihood of cognitive decline. Under the original legislation, everyone undergoing MAID had to have decision-making capacity at the time MAID was provided. This meant that many people requested MAID before they really wanted to, just to make sure that they had mental capacity. Now, where death is reasonably foreseeable, they can waive final consent. The way this works is, um, at the time of the second assessment, the patient can choose to sign a waiver of final consent, stating the date for MAID provision, and affirming that should they lose mental capacity, the doctor may still proceed with MAID. But this is not the case for track two. If your death is not reasonably foreseeable, you still need to have mental capacity on the day that MAID is provided. Next slide, please, Angela. So obviously there's different rules depending on what, whether your death is reasonably foreseeable or not. And some of the difference are, differences are potentially very significant. The most significant one in cases where de cognitive decline is a factor, as it is in HD, being the ability to waive final consent. If you're track one, you can waive it. If you're track two, you can't. So what does reasonably foreseeable mean? There is no rigid time frame. There wasn't under Bill C-14 and there isn't under Bill C-7. Um, in practice, over the period since MAID was legalized, it seems to have been a period up to about five years. But as I said, it's left up to the assessors to decide based on factors unique to each patient. CAMAP, C-A-M-A-P, stands for the Canadian Association of MAID Assessors and Providers. In one of their publications, they provide an example stating that once a patient with HD is suffering intolerably and all treatments acceptable have failed and they are in a state of irreversible decline and they request MAID, they're reasonably predictable, in fact, almost completely predictable, death from their condition should allow consideration of MAID regardless of prognosis. Um, that is a quote from this CAMAT publication that is available on the internet. The publication uses the term reasonably predictable instead of reasonably foreseeable because the latter rarely occurs in medical literature. 
but the publication makes it clear that these terms should be considered interchangeable. It is important to note that this doesn't mean that every, every patient who um, with HD who applies for MAID will be judged as having a reasonably foreseeable death. This will be up to the assessors. However, it's also important to note that if you don't agree, if the patient doesn't agree with the assessor's determination, they can seek additional opinions. Next slide, please. Some people with disabilities feel that the expanded provisions under Bill C-7 leave them vulnerable to coercion. Certainly, there is a need for safeguards so that this does not happen. Protection of persons with disabilities is one of the topics that is being reviewed um, and mandated for review under Bill C-7, and the report is due in 2023. Notwithstanding the absolute necessity for safeguards, uh, there's a number of points worth making, I think. Um, first of all, most people with disabilities are as mentally capable as the rest of us and are entitled to the same choices. Secondly, a majority of people with disabilities support MATE, 84%, according to a poll done in February of 21. Third, it has been people with disabilities that have driven the development of MADE in Canada. Sue Rodriguez, Kay Carter, Gloria Taylor, Jean Truchon, Nicole Gladue have all had disabilities. Finally, practitioners report that if there is disagreement within the family regarding MADE, it's much more likely to be that the patient wants it, but the family doesn't. Uh, next slide, please, Angel, and back to you, June. Coming on board, just clicking the right buttons. So the next slide we'll, uh, we'll see here, this is how the process of MAID um, progresses in Canada. Uh, <clears throat> medical assistance in dying is, it became legal through federal legislation, but healthcare in Canada is a provincial jurisdiction. So each province has developed slightly different delivery systems, but there are more similarities and differences. So I'm speaking from the Alberta perspective, but it is fairly uniform across all of Canada. First is the contemplative phase, when people begin to think about their end of life um, in relation to the diagnosis which they have, especially if they're getting a, a life-limiting illness where the hope of medic medical recovery is very limited. The first point of contact would be the family physician or maybe the specialty clinic they were in. If the medical staff have an ethical or religious reason to not participate in MAID, um, they're usually referred to as conscientious objectors, they can decline to be part of the assessment process. But throughout Canada, professional staff are required both by the federal and provincial legislation and by their professional organizations to inform the patient that the basic MAID uh, option is available to them and it can be as little as giving them a phone number or a website to look at but they can't uh, remain silent about how made could be explored um, how may how and when made is explored with the patient depends on the openness of the patient and also the openness of the medical team this isn't usually something that's discussed at first diagnosis but maybe further on as the person is beginning treatment, but also looking at what is the quality of my life going to be? What can I expect over the next few years? There continues to be ethical debate uh, within medical groups, whether the physician or the medical team can raise the issue of medical assistance in dying as being, being one option at end of life, or whether the patient has to know about MAID and then ask their professional team. This is becoming less and less of a distinction now, but it's still important to note that um, more and more we continue to advocate that medical staff have the duty to inform patients of all their options at end of life. Medical teams want to talk about things that can uh, extend life. Uh, but they also need to know that the patient and the family are often worrying about what is end of life going to look like. In all provinces, there are patient 
information phone numbers that are quite displayed in medical offices. Uh, in Alberta, it's 811. And there the nurses will give basic information about the MAID process and also will mail out the application form if the person doesn't have a computer available. Otherwise, provincial uh, health services websites have sections on MAID and also have the uh, initial legal form that has to be submitted and they have to sign with one witness to begin the process. At the end of the presentation, there'll be a resource slide uh, that you can uh, photograph and it's also on the slide deck which you can download. But it's important to remember that MAID is not a crisis service. Many patients wait too long in their illness to begin to get their assessments. And patients can get their assessments and then delay uh, the time of provision of MAID, maybe even up to a year beyond, as long as they know they won't uh, lose competency in that time. And the patient is informed uh, that they can withdraw the application at end of time. Um, they have to be uh, co mentally competent to sign uh, to begin the assessment process, but this doesn't mean that they're aware of everything, like who's the president and uh, serial sevens. It just means that they're competent to us understand their illness, their illness progression, and that assisted death means that they will have medication that will end their life. So that's the definition of informed consent. The next phase is the determination or the assessment phase. The MAID staff will help the patient uh, locate two different and independent doctors or nurse practitioners for these assessments. If there's any question about mental competency or underlying mental health conditions, perhaps depression or cognitive impairment, which might impair the patient's uh, competency, a psychiatrist can be uh, asked to be an assessor as well. If the two physicians disagree, as Carrie implied, the patient can request other assessments. And we've known of patients who have had five different assessments until over time they find uh, people who do agree with their eligibility. It is important that patients be informed of this ability to have further assessments. Some become very discouraged um, and withdraw from the process without knowing um, that they can apply again. The assessments are quite extensive, often one to two hours, really trying to understand the person's value system, why they would choose to hasten their death, and informing them of palliative care and other things that are available to them. If a person is judged not eligible, they can be referred to other services like mental health, specialty clinics, or palliative care. In the third phase is diagnosed, uh, described as the action phase. If the patient is eligible, the MAID staff will work with the patient and family to set a date for their death, the time of the MAID provision, and the patient can defer that time of death as we've discussed. They can have MAID procedure in uh, the hospital, in palliative care, in a hospice, and at their own home. Some people even have the procedure outdoors. The patient can be transferred home for a short time with palliative home care if they wish to die at home and the family's in agreement. The issue of whether a facility will allow the final provision of MAID in their facilities um, should by, be identified at the time of the first uh, assessment and alternatives uh, explored. As you've probably read in the media, uh, most faith-based hospices, care facilities, and hospitals, they now allow the assessments to happen in their facilities. That was not so in 2016. But they all now still require that the patient be transferred out of their facility uh, to another uh, location. Uh, this means that drastically ill and in pain patients must be what we refer to as forced transferred by ambulance to another facility uh, where the staff do not know them. At least they'll know the assessor that is doing the provision. This, is a, this issue of non-provision of MAID in publicly funded institutions is an ongoing social justice issue currently being addressed by Dying with Dignity. And there is, as of February, a petition to parliamentarians 
and a court challenge that's being raised uh, by this limitation of a public health service. The issues about uh, care after death for the family and the funeral arrangements will also be discussed. The date of provision can be delayed if the patient will be capable of having the uh, competency later in life. If the patient is dying at home, and I'll uh, limit it to this discussion, the physician will pick up the medications from the pharmacy. They'll bring all the supplies with them. And in all provinces, there must be two medical staff present. Usually the other person is a nurse who sets up the IV and is there for the patient and the family. Again, on that final day, the patient is informed that they can withdraw their consent and ask to state that they do know that the provision of this medication will cause their death. Patients with verbal dif difficulties can give consent in other legal options that are available to them. In, May in Canada, MAID is administered in two forms. It can be oral, which is a slurry which the patient drinks, or by intravenous. In the United States, it's only in the oral form. The oral form is seldom used in Canada because it is considered less reliable. The patient must drink uh, this liquid and they may often regurgitate the liquid because of their underlying illness. Um, so there's been very few uh, oral presentations and the patient must sign a form that says if their death does not occur after a set time period, like maybe 15 minutes or half an hour, that they will accept that the doctor will do an IV administration of the medication to hasten their death. When you're using the intravenous uh, method, the two IV sites are set up. One as a backup, <clears throat> and four medications are administered into the IV site. The first relaxes the patient, such as an anesthetic would. The second uh, is given to keep the vein open. The third medication induces a deep coma, and the fourth medication stops uh, all the vital organs, the hearts and the lungs, so that that uh, ceases, the patient dies, and the patient dies peacefully within several minutes in a deep coma, and the doctor must wait five minutes to declare that the patient is heart dead or cardiac uh, has stopped. Friends and family and children may be present. The patient is alert as the medications begin so they can talk to patient, uh, family and say their last goodbye. Some family members find this very comforting being in the room. Others prefer to stay outside the room and that's a family discussion. Ceremonies uh, before the uh, death can occur with uh, ministers, uh, other faith leaders being present if they're in agreement and um, whatever the patient has planned. Often patients plan to have a celebration of life before they die so that they can say farewell to family that they uh, wish to do. So the care after death. The pa family can sit with the body, uh, whether the death is in a facility or at home. The IV sites must remain in place. And arrangements will have been made for the removal of the body by the funeral home. And uh, this is uh, done with dignity and also um, confidentiality and the paperwork including the death certificate are signed by the medical people before they leave that day. Uh, the next slide I will discuss some of the resources that are available for families. Um, first of all, Dying with Dignity. Um, this, as Carrie said, is a 40-year-old organization they are doing a lot of webinars. They've done a lot of political action, uh, presenting reports at different parliamentary hearings. Um, they have a lot of firsthand stories from families and from patients about MAID, usually one or two posted a month. Um, they recently published a new booklet that's called uh, Patients' Rights, uh, which is about a 30-page document which uh, covering the things I've just discussed. They also have launched petitions and uh, consult with physicians across Canada uh, about MAID. They have a physician uh, consultation group that guides both Dying with Dignity and professionals in the community. 
it's important when you look for medical assistance in dying on uh, the internet that you spell out fully medical assistance in dying. If you put in MAID, you'll get house cleaning services. And a lot of people are frustrated by that. But this acronym is sticking, even though people have said, can't you change that name? Um, the Can Canadian Virtual Hospice is a very useful site, both for professionals, but mainly for families and patients. They provide videos, uh, talks, uh, some grief support groups, and they talk about all kinds of end-of-life issues, um, also uh, grief and bereavement after death as well. And recently, just this year, they launched one site which refers to um, grief and grief support around MAID, and they have a pa family patient booklet of about five pages that explains the whole MAID process and also links to the various MAID groups in the different provinces. And the other one is that in February this year, they've uh, added a site that is specifically oriented to neurological illnesses. Bridge C14 and Bridge for You are two grassroots organizations that sprang up, one in Ottawa and one in Vancouver, but now of course they're online. And they focus on grief support for families after a maid death, and because often it's comforting for people to talk with other families that have gone through the maid process. And they also are matching volunteers to individual families they may have some online discussion groups, and they will um, also match up with families who are in the MAID assessment process, because often the MAID staff uh, don't have the time to do that one-on-one -on -one support. And lastly is CAMAP, the Canadian Association of Medical Assessors and Providers, which is more of a professional resource, but they're doing research and publishing papers, as Carrie referred to, on some of these more um, difficult to understand aspects of the act. I'll turn it back to you, Carrie. Hi, thanks, June. Um, we hope that this presentation has been informative. Uh, please tell your friends and family what you want for end of life care. They need to know. Uh, it's important to fill out an advanced care plan and this needs to be done in addition to a personal directive, a power of attorney and a will. There is an ACP kit available on the Dying with Dignity Canada website. There are lots of other resources available on that website as well as June has said. The vision of Dying with Dignity Canada is that we should all have the right to choose our own good death. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you to the Hunting to Society for inviting us as, as speakers, to Angèle Bénard for uh, acting as our mentor and moderator, and to Kelsey Laidlaw for making everything go as smoothly as possible. We will leave the resources slide up as we move into the Q&A session. Great, well, thank you both. Um, so just as we're starting into the Q&A section, I just want to flag that we've received some great questions, but with the limit in time, we may not be able to get to all of them. So um, I would encourage folks, if we don't get to your question, please reach out to your regional uh, HSC social worker and uh, they can help either answer those questions or help you connect to folks that can um, get those answers for you. So um, just the first question I'm going to ask you both is, We've had a presentation on um, HD research and around donation of tissue and samples. And I also know that some of our community members uh, want to be organ donors. So in light of those considerations, can a MAID patient donate organs? June, I will ask you to answer that one. <laughs> one of my passions about organ donation, and hopefully we've all signed the donation. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, the medications that are used for a made death do not disqualify someone from donating organs. Uh, it may be more associated with the underlying illness and the prior to death medical treatments. But the one complication is the death with made has to happen in an intensive care unit. So the person has to be in a large city hospital because the transplant team needs to be available to accept the body 
five minutes after the death so that the organs can be sustained for transplant. So those, uh, if you're interested in made donation or have signed your form, important to bring it up early in the assessment and have your forms already signed because there also becomes an ethical debate if you have, if you're wanting the made process, um, that you might stay in that to donate, feel obligated to donate your organs. And so it has to be seen as two very distinct decisions and you can't discuss the organ donation process with your mate assessor. It has to be someone from the transplant team. So explore it early, but it's a wonderful way to uh, give back to society. Okay, thank you. Natalie asks, um, what are the end of life options for someone who may be in advanced stages of HD and is stopping to eat? And in this case, she's unable to speak now but she has expressed in the past that she doesn't want a feeding tube or life extending options. So what would be her options? Again, I'm going to turn this over to June. Terry <laughs> uh, and I are trying to share this out, but I have been in, in it longer. Um, yes, if a person has trouble speaking, they've probably developed their own support support system professionally, perhaps they're using a word board or even blinking to do their yes and no's. Um, if they have signed their advanced care plan that they don't want feeding tubes, again, that should be explicitly shared from the family. Uh, the family can help with end of life decisions for anything except for MAID. The patient has to be the one to engage in accepting that. So. What would be important is that the patient get assessed as soon as she can, um, make the decision of when she wants to make the death. The longer she leaves it, the more likelihood she might lose competency or there may not be medical staff willing to assess her as competent for that. Uh, but if she's in a facility that's not supportive of MAID, every attempt should be made to transfer her to a facility that would allow her to have her assessments and provision in that location. She doesn't need the distress of having non-supportive staff. Okay. Um, and I, I think I'm gonna end it with this question because we're unfortunately running out of time, but would you know how um, a made death is affected or how it affects life insurance? I... That's very clear. I'll just jump in. <laughs> um, yes, it was clarified uh, right at the beginning of MAID becoming legal that all life insurance companies accept that as a cause of death. There would be questions if a life insurance policy was taken out, you know, close to the time of death, as there would be with any life insurance policy, but otherwise it does not disqualify one. Okay. Well, thank you so much, June and Carrie, for that compassionate presentation that was very informative and dealt with an important topic with such sensitivity. We truly appreciate you sharing this up-to-date information and thank you for volunteering your time and energy with HSC and with Dying With Dignity. We have a break now from 1.30 till 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and then we'll return for the next session then. So thank you again and we'll see you soon. <laughs>